Hey, John here, and welcome back to episode two of Create and Activate, the podcast where we explore creativity and activation and the role it plays with today's marketeers. As ever, I'm joined by Adam Britton, who's going to intro today's episode. Hello. So, yeah, today's episode is super exciting. We've got Emma Louise Jones here with us, and she'll be speaking all about how to get the most out of talent whilst on set and also with your sports sponsorship in general. She's got an abundance of experience, so it's really, really exciting. But before we get into it, here's what you've got to look forward to. They want to see the player enjoying themselves, being invested in it, and feeling like they're they're doing it because they want to not because they're being paid to do it we have to put ourselves out there and we have to be not just all shiny and glamorous but we have to show the vulnerable raw and real side of it and they're the bits let's all be honest that we like and then finally i'd probably say don't panic so much about it being viral because Mm -hmm. good content will just do well regardless and also videos that go viral are so unpredictable like so unpredictable but if you could spend all your time going right how do we make this viral and actually overlook a really simple but good concept that's still going to get a shed load of eyes on it hi emma how's it going oh good thank you how are you lads Oh, really good, well. yeah. Really well, thank you. Really well. So, first of all, let's get started with how did you get into sports presenting? Um, so, growing up, I mean, am I allowed to swear? Do it, you want. Yes. I was shit at sport, right? <laughs> but I was always enthusiastic. I was one of them kids where the teacher felt a bit sorry for me, probably, because I was like, yeah, I'll do it. And they're like, oh, you're not very good. Um, but I grew up in a, a sporting environment. All my family were very sporty, particularly my two brothers and my granddad. Um, and so I was always like the cheerleader, like, yeah, go on, go on, go on, because I wasn't very good. Um and I've always been interested in people and people's stories. So, and, and writing, actually, I really enjoyed writing growing up. So I always knew that I'd want to pursue something in journalism somewhere, mm-hmm. somehow. Um, and I studied journalism. That was at Sheffield Hallam. Right. I went over there and did that. And then I left and I was a bit like, oh, I should probably do something now. Mm. Um, so I worked in a call centre and saved some money and then I did a master's in broadcast journalism. And during that time, I actually pulled my finger out and went and did work experience over at Channel 5 News, a uh, Key 103 radio station mm. in Manchester before yeah, it was yeah. the Hits Radio. Steve Penk. But yeah, Remember exactly. Remember oh, Steve Penk. Yeah, the good old days. <laughs> um, so I did all that kind of stuff wherever I could, basically. I'd go and like tell anybody you know if you need help I remember I was so annoying like I'd walk around that radio station be like hi me again do you want any jingles making can I do anything a tea a coffee do you want anything um so I did that and I realized that um hard news wasn't for me because I I'm too attached to people that I don't mm-hmm. know in a weird way I, I felt too emotional about their stories and there were a few examples of situations that I was put in where I had to um deal with death the, and and see people's heartache and that didn't just sit right with me I didn't I didn't want them to feel they had to talk to me at such a emotional. devastating time yeah, of their lives time, yeah. exactly mm-hmm. and actually I, I've told this story a few times there was one instance where I was sent to a vigil of a man who died in really tragic circumstances and I was given a Marantz do you remember the Marantz back in the good old days that's that, that was the recording device and I didn't really know how to use it but they were like go and record some Vox Pops with people I ended up just crying with the family and I didn't yeah. know how to use this Marantz So I took it back to the editor and said, I'm so sorry. I think you might just have me crying on there with the family. um, And I don't know how to delete it. So you're going to have to do it. And it was, I remember very vividly thinking on that day, I can't do this. Mm. Um, But I loved the presenting side. I used to watch the presenters and be like, wow, that's like such a buzz. They bring me in the studio. We'd have a laugh together on air and that kind of thing. So I got him to present in. I went into radio. Love radio, by the way. I think radio is an unbelievable medium, Mm -hmm. particularly throughout the pandemic. In terms of loneliness, feeling like you have that friend there Mm -hmm. to talk to you and an intimate level was brilliant. Um, So that was my, you know, my original way in was through radio. And... um, we worked with like local football clubs when we were doing, you know, hosting different things. I really enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed the atmosphere. I enjoyed being there and in and amongst it. And then, yeah, one of the guys moved to Leeds United and was like, look, we might have a potential gig because I'd worked with him on hosting stuff a few times. Mm-hmm. If you're interested, I was like, yeah. Um, sent over the worst like piece to camera I've ever done in my <laughs> life. Um, I'd just finished a breakfast radio show, stood on my own in a room, pretending to interview a football player. Like that's difficult, <laughs> let's be honest, lads. Cardboard sent cut it out. over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then, 
yeah, just hounded them there afterwards. I was like on their case all the time, all the time. And eventually they said, look, if you're prepared to sacrifice your weekends, there's not a huge budget. So it's up to you because you work five days a week as well. Best of luck. And I was like, I want to do this. So I'm going to do it. And then, yeah, so it just developed from there. That was five years ago that I first started working on the club TV channel. Fell in love with it literally straight away and just wanted to be there all the time. Um, And... I started doing other freelance TV work off the back of that while I was still hosting Breakfast Radio full time. And I realised that something was going to have to give because I just couldn't do it all. Mm -hmm. There was not enough hours in the day to do it all. So I was like, do you know what? I'm going to pursue this full time. I love it. And why not? Because life's short. Um, So yeah, I've just been doing doing it ever since, just doing all sorts of various different bits of work. Amazing. We know you're a big Leeds United fan. What other sports do you like and what other kind of jobs have you been doing lately? Um, So it's... Still predominantly football, but recently I've been lucky enough to be offered a gig doing the Championship Rugby, Rugby League for Premier Sports, which, again, it was one of those things where, and you boys will know this, when you get a feeling of an opportunity, like, you you feel how it makes you mm. feel. Like, it made me feel, like, excited and light. And I was like, I need to go after this. I really have to make sure they, they, they know I want to do this. Mm-hmm. And it was only early this year, it was January, that I actually started doing it at the end of January. And I've just fallen in love with it. The whole Rugby League community have just opened their arms to, me and welcomed me and been so wonderful you know that the response I, 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 I couldn't imagine it um, and then more recently I started working with British Triathlon doing like shows and stuff for them and again I've loved it because that's a totally it's totally different to football and stuff in yeah. that you know it's it's a lot more about the individual and their own kind of perseverance and how they you know their training and everything it's totally different and I'm loving just exploring all these different worlds it's Mm -hmm. exciting for me well the rugby one's really interesting because why do you think were you a rugby fan beforehand Fairweather I've I've, I've followed rugby but not like a fan of a club in particular why do you think that sort of connection works so well do you think it's your personality with the kind of the followers of rugby league or yeah, I think potentially, do you know what it is? It's very much um, what I found is rugby league is itself. Mm. It doesn't pretend to be something it's not. And that's a bit like me. Like, yeah. I know what I am and I'm happy with that. Mm. And I, I, so we kind of get on. We kind of we gel as, as people. Um, and I can honestly say, like, I, I'm not just talking about the fans and the players and head coaches and all that. I'm talking about the other people that work inside rugby as you know in sport there are so many different areas of it mm-hmm. there hasn't been a single interaction I've had that's been negative all of it has been so positive and the team that I get to work with every Monday night make me feel like the luckiest person alive like one of them has just become one of my best mates straight yeah. away and I, I know you, you're probably a bit like oh shut up we get it you love it <laughs> I cannot express like if I could bottle the feeling yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. like I just know that when I get old and I think about my life yeah, I reflect on that yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you probably be... still know them. Yeah, it feels that, like that, doesn't yeah, it? With that, rugby, yeah. definitely. Yeah. I always think with union and league, it's almost like once you're in that family, you're there you're forever. In, yeah. yeah, and and it's like this feeling of you know, it's weird to think that five months ago I didn't know these people, and mm-hmm. now you know we share so much of our lives with each other, and we just from that first night working together, we just got on. We just yeah. straight away clicked. You boys will know what that feeling's like, and it's, you just it's because you you share similar values as well, yeah. isn't it? You know, and it goes back to you know what you've just said there is you've very similar in terms of your personality and the sport itself so you can kind of slot straight in and that's something that we always say when it comes to sports sponsorship and the fact that your values need to align and the fact that the the brand and the club or the association need to be very similar to each other Mm. um we see a lot of clubs or associations almost using the talent or the players to advertise and in terms of you know pointing at a Mm. product saying come and buy this rather than maybe a more engaging way of doing stuff how would you what would you say the best way of utilizing talent and and that sort of sports personality is it say it's exactly what you've just said it has to be authentic mm-hmm. like it has to be something that they're genuinely interested in and something that allows their personality to come across because anybody can stand in front of something and say oh you need to buy this this is mm-hmm. great we're not um particularly with the generations now that you see we're not fools like yeah. we can see through things we know exactly what they are and i actually think the best way of you know getting any one on board with anything is they want to see the player enjoying themselves being invested in it and feeling like they're they're doing it because they want to not mm-hmm. because they're being paid to yeah. do it yeah, yeah they want to see the real person yeah. don't they 
That's, that's what they're after, isn't it? Definitely. It's so much of um, everything in the world right now is personality based. It's people. I mean, I think it always has been, but now that's just increased tenfold because we have social media. We have so many different outlets and so many different ways that people can express themselves and um, tell people about their lives that mm -hmm. actually we expect more from mm -hmm. them. We expect, we want to see more and more of that. And, you know, that's why some of the biggest Premier League. Uh, football players in the world um, have got these brands that are on board that want to work with them. It's because people buy into the people as well, mm -hmm. not just the person on the pitch, but the people. Yeah, absolutely. What, what have you kind of found in the past has worked to get the most out of them, even if it's just on set, whilst you've been there and your experience of, of doing that? I think there's certain things like um, ensuring that you're prepared and logistically you've had a complete run through before the the player or whoever it is gets there so that when they do get there you've ironed out any potential issues that could go wrong um i also think what's worked is the enthusiasm of the people around them like if you're invested in what you're doing, for example, if I'm the presenter and the camera crew and everybody there are invested and in excited and enthusiastic about this thing, that wears off on the player. They mm -hmm. get that yeah. because then they'd look a bit shitty, wouldn't they, if they were yeah. just grumpy and didn't want to have a go or yeah. get involved. So I would say those two things are really important, making sure that you're prepared and that the logistics are all ironed out and your own enthusiasm towards mm -hmm. it. Yeah, absolutely. I think when that happens as well, even if... From my experience with it, even if on that occasion they could be a little bit standoffish, by the end of it, they've really enjoyed it. Next time you go, they're like, oh, I remember you yeah. guys, because they deal with five, six, seven, or, you know, all the way up to 20 different sponsors or production crews. When they've enjoyed their time, either with us or with certain presenters, they remember it next time, and it's actually exactly they're really that. involved in it. We've had certain occasions, actually it was at Leeds, where um, we only needed the players for... I think it was like 10, 15 minutes each and then they could go. By the end of it, they were all just staying and watching the other Aww. players taking part. And in the end, there was about 20 players all stood there. And I remember actually one of them was, um, it was with a, with a gaming company. So you had to be over 25 to appear. And Calvin Phillips got really angry because he couldn't be on it. Oh, and he was like, but I want to do it. I want to do it. We were like, you're not allowed to because at the time he was like 22 or whatever he was. And he was like, but can't I do it? I was like, we had to, <laughs> we had to pretend that we filmed him. <laughs> we had to say, oh yeah, all right, mate. Yeah, we'll, we'll let you have a go like pretend that we filmed him do it obviously we couldn't release the content uh, but yeah it's crazy that when you kind of get that peek behind the curtain that they are just normal people yes. yeah. and they want to get involved as, as long as the content that you're doing is really engaging and they're excited about it they want to get just as involved as anyone else would want to whereas I've also had the reverse where I've had certain players pretending they, they can't speak English for example and coming over going oh sorry yeah. and it's like I saw an interview with you yesterday you, you, you speak fluent you're fluent yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, talking about behind the scenes what do you think of Drive to Survive and uh all or nothing series I, I think those kind of things now we're going to see more and more of them and I think they are I think they're great for sport in general in terms of how they captivate audiences because we as people, as human beings, like I just um, kind of referred to earlier, we invest in people. We like people, we like journeys and whatever they look like, we get on board with them mm -hmm. and then we root for people. And I think, you know, social media is a huge thing and obviously you've got Netflix and companies like that dominating like in terms of documentaries and tapping into all sorts of different sports and I all, I think there's a level of expectancy that we do get that now and I think that actually there's a real understanding from some of the biggest sports in the world mm -hmm. that in order to retain that engagement you know or bring new audiences in we have to put ourselves out there and we have to be not just all shiny and glamorous but we have to show the vulnerable raw and real well, Side, side of yeah. it and they're the bits let's all be honest that we like because mm -hmm. we as human beings we like to know that we're not the only imperfect people in the world yeah. and when we see bits of other people and go oh my god like they're so successful and they're vulnerable too mm -hmm. and they don't always have really good days we're like we we get that feeling and it's how mm -hmm. you make people feel that is like that's the hook yeah it's the emotional attachment isn't it getting people Completely. to feel emotional to it and it goes from that kind of netflix or or um, amazon series as you say because yeah you're absolutely right the, the the moments that always stick out for example the tottenham documentary it's that argument between ali and dyer in the in the dressing room exactly. that's the bit or the or the conversation with danny rose and jose in the office yes. they're the bits that mm. stick out not the happy times of them celebrating a win it's actually the sad times that you you remember and 
I'd say in the past there's probably been documentaries made that didn't quite work because the clubs got involved or whoever's got involved to try and cut those mm -hmm. bits out because they want to make it all look rosy. Whereas actually if go, you can go all the way back to the 90s and go back to Neil Warnock's um, yeah. infamous rants in the dressing room. They're, <laughs> Sheffield United are still showing that now <laughs> as their best content it's on what social media. Yeah, it yeah. is though. It is. And you're right what you just touched on there. It has to be all or nothing. Yeah. Now you either have to give it all mm. and let everybody see everything behind the scenes or you don't do it because yeah. it, then it's not authentic. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the same with almost branded content. So obviously the streaming side of it and the, you know, the peak behind the curtains, absolutely um, essential these days, as you say, because it's actually revolutionised F1 as a whole. And mm. I prob you're probably going to see more and more sports doing and doing, trying to replicate that model. I'd probably say, I don't know, when we were at the British Grand Prix, British Grand Prix a few weeks ago, I'd say every 10 minutes the host mentioned that documentary. Mm -hmm. wow. It was just constant. I'd probably say 40% of the people that were there were probably only there because they fell in love with the sport because mm -hmm. of Netflix. And we're probably going to see more and more sports go down there. But when it comes to an actual sponsor of a club, how important do you think it is that we get that emotional tie and that they believe in the club and the values and the fans and want to have that emotional connection with the fans? I mean, it's everything. That is, and that's not me over exaggerating. Mm -hmm. That is everything. Because if you are going to get whatever message or product, whatever it is across, people have to see, everybody has to believe in it. It has to be like cohesive. It has to work and be organic. And it taps in against what we said about emotional, that, that connection and that feeling. That, if you, if you do something and somebody, either the player that you're working with or the club or the fans, if somebody's watching that going, I don't, I'm not quite sure that I believe that, that, that the legitimacy of it, it's, it's game over. Like, mm -hmm. that's not what people want to watch. So I, for me, that is everything. There's okay. been a really big rise with esports. It's, you know, pretty much everywhere. And sometimes it's as big and attracting as many people as actual reality games. Where do you see the future of esports and sponsorship? I think it's going to be massive, even bigger than we're seeing it at the minute, because you're right, in that growth, it's been phenomenal. And the uni unique thing about esports is it has this holding power. People will watch for longer. So if you can tap into that and get whatever it is in terms of sponsorship across in esports, you've got an audience that are engaged for an extended period of time. And that's so crucial. And, when, and now football clubs and it, other you know other uh, sports they're all looking at esports going we can't avoid this we need mm -hmm. to immerse ourselves into it now it's taking up so much space that we're seeing that there's no way that's not going backwards there's mm -hmm. no way that's going backwards mm -hmm. that's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and it's becoming like well it is an industry all of its own yeah. nobody would have ever thought that would you have thought that like you know when i was a kid and i was gaming i would not have thought that when i you know when i'm older i could potentially get paid to have people watch me it's even crazy, just play this it? game yeah. it's crazy mm. but it's not going away and mm. with the generations coming through now it is only going to get bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. So I think, but like I say, I think the unique thing with that is the holding power that it has with people. Yeah, we're also seeing it. We had uh, Isaac Kirk, our digital strategist, on the last episode, and he was mentioning how professionals, um, professional sports people, when they retire, they can also then revert back to esports. Yeah. We've seen Aguero now on, on Twitch for six hours every single day. Yeah. Um, and it's yeah, it's amazing that actually they're seeing it as an outlet themselves. And there's also, not even when they're re when they've retired, actually, you know, even yeah. like, I think Tyra Ming sits on Twitch during his England, during the uh, Euros. I think there was like quite a big thing that all the team were downstairs and he was like, no, I've got to get on Twitch, lads, and get upstairs and do do esports, which is just amazing. As you say, you'd never would have imagined that. Um, when it comes to kind of your top three tips to make sports marketing really work, what would you what would you say? I go back to that word that I always think, and I think this in anything that you're doing, authenticity. It has to be real. It has to be authentic. Uh, the other thing I would say is don't be afraid to have fun with it. Like, make sure that it doesn't have to be serious and it doesn't have to be, like, fun as in, oh, let's let's make sure we make this fun, but let it be relaxed. Let it be, let it kind of almost take its own route mm -hmm. within reason. Um, and then finally, I'd probably say don't panic so much about it being viral because mm -hmm. good content will just do well regardless. And also videos that go viral are so unpredictable, like so unpredictable. Yeah. But if you could spend all your time going, right, how do we make this viral and actually overlook a really simple but good concept that's still going to get a shed load of eyes on it. Yeah, it's usually the stuff that's the ad 
ad lib stuff in the middle that goes viral. For example, the most recent one with, with Jack Grealish yes. and, and his pointing at the England. Oh, which was absolutely which brilliant, was, by the way. I yeah. love him. I love him. <laughs> it was exactly that. And do you know, it, that's funny that because it kind of feeds into what you were saying earlier about how when you work with somebody and they see you again. So I'd worked with Jack previously. Mm-hmm. But yeah, and, it was with uh, McGinn stuff, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, and he yeah, was yeah. brilliant. He yeah. was absolutely lovely. It, the, he even offered to go to the canteen and get me some bangers and mash or whatever they'd been eating. <laughs> I was like, what a guy. And he allowed that interview to go on longer as well. I was told I needed to wrap it up. And he was like, no, you're fine. Really, really nice person. Mm-hmm. Um, so then when I saw him walking over, I felt I know... Jack well enough by this point because I worked with him for a few hours that day to call him over Mm -hmm. and when he did that I knew that I was just wetting myself and the lads around him were and I thought if we're all finding this this hilarious everybody else is going to and you are exactly right Ad that was the moment that I knew would be the 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 one that people loved completely we weren't even supposed to speak to Jack it was just that he was there at the time we happened to be working out where he was on the map for the record by the way I was equally a shit I had no (laughs) idea and I had it all written down in front of me Um, but you're right it's those like off the cuff bits that are unexpected have you ever done a piece of content and just thought like wow Oh, that's going to be amazing. That's the best thing I've ever done. It was, I mean, not like necessarily the best thing I've ever done, but that bit with Jack is where I came away and I was laughing like the whole way mm. home to myself and thinking I had such a good time. And I think when you're having a good time, people see that. Like the, mm-hmm. the lads had a good time as well, I think. So I came away from that thinking that was in many ways such a simple concept, yeah. but it worked and I know other people will find fun in this. Yeah. That that was a standout for me. Yeah, they're the bits that people need to understand it quickly, don't they? Yeah, it's so simple. Yeah. And even going back to the stuff that United do with, um, I don't know if you've seen it where they just get, I don't know, Rashford doing the, um, you know, like a little board game or, you know, um, Axel Twenzaby, yeah. when they were doing that, broke the world record, Guinness world record for hungry, hungry, uh, hungry, hungry hippos. I love that. Whereas whilst they were filming it, that's amazing. Is he actually going in the? Is he going he's in, in the Guinness? That's brilliant. I love that. But that's, that's the mad. kind of stuff that works, yeah, isn't it? Is that yeah. the yeah. people? People love that shit. Yeah, absolutely. What's your all-time favourite sports marketing campaign? Whether it's Ooh. something you've done yourself or something that you've seen, um, you know, anywhere. I'd say in terms of uh, of its time, do you remember the Nike World Cup, the Brazil, the, the, in the airport? Yeah, I yeah, think that yeah. of its time was like, wow, that was brilliant. Mm-hmm. More um, current, I love, you know, um, Wingman, that KFC yeah, yeah. did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where they, because for me, that was brilliant because you're basically, you feel like a passenger or, a, you know, like you're sat in the back seat and you're just overhearing and laughing and that yeah. is the most natural thing because ultimately yes they know they're being filmed mm-hmm. the lads do and stuff but um there is an element of you you feel you can be a little more yourself probably in that environment look you're mm. in your car mm-hmm. you're driving you know big your cameras territory. it's all yeah. like gopros or whatever. Yeah. yeah and very quickly you probably forget that the cameras are yeah, on you exactly. and you just you get this insight into their personality mm-hmm. and that is what we want remind me was it the, was it two of them so what, there wasn't a presenter was, in the, in no, the cars it was, it was just it was, for example it'd be like Andy Robertson Andy Robertson and, and, Trent, and yeah Alexander Trent Arnold, yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. And, and so that's just, probably why as well because they feel natural around each other they're mates yeah. and it's mm-hmm. just those two trying to get the most out of each other rather than it being a presenter trying to pull things out of each exactly. other exactly yeah. and they know each other well enough to know certain nuggets about each exactly, other probably yeah. to yeah. already know which buttons to press with each other and how to get things out so I feel like that was very clever yeah. very very clever yeah it also goes back to even things like um although it's not sports marketing i guess it's more to do with advertising sky sports but the um the stuff that Micka richards and roy Keane do and their oh. personalities together mm. are just i fire, love it i yeah. love it like they just shouldn't work should they <laughs> like together but it's brilliant you yeah. can't help but you're like and and when they're in situations, we as viewers are anticipating. We're like, "Oh, you know, what was yeah. Roy going to react to me?" Yeah. You can't help it, and I yeah. love that stuff. Yeah. So, how important do you think the role of social media is in making campaigns really move and spread with with wider audiences? I think it's the most important thing. You know, there's a reason that so much money is put into social media campaigns, and I think in our lifetime is where we've seen a real shift in that. It used to be, you know, let's put things on TV, let's do things, let's put signs up. It was that kind of thing. But now social media is the one thing that pretty much everybody that we know has and spends a lot of time on. First thing I do when I wake up, I'm probably the same as, as you mm-hmm. boys, roll over, pick up my phone, what's what's going on in the world, scroll, yep. scroll, scroll. And if you can 
tap into that and get someone hooked and watching it that is so powerful because like when it comes up and says how much screen time I've had <laughs> I'm alarmed I'm like shit I did not realise this hours yeah today. yeah yeah it's amazing but it was just 19 <laughs> you're alarmed and then you still do it the next week exactly <laughs> exactly but such is the power of it and I do yeah. think that's the most important tool in any kind of mm-hmm. campaign at all what, which is a campaign that's really flown on social that you've been involved in is there anything in particular that that springs to mind um, uh, probably again that nationwide one mm-hmm. because it was so um natural uh, that 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 bit with the lads in particular and people just kind of warmed to the fact that it was a natural piece of content so i would say that yeah um i mean i didn't expect it quite to take off in that way it did because then it started popping up on all sorts of different sites and you know different you get some of the big big um social media presences don't you that share content and it started popping up on there Mm -hmm. um, and people were sending me I was like wow this has gone bigger than Mm -hmm. I was expecting it to go I thought like people that who follow me might have laughed along but a lot of people did so yeah I would say that one it's interesting though because although it wasn't as big but even the the Jack and John McGinn one with William Hill was pretty big and maybe that's just because I'm in that sort of villa social bubble online but i still feel like it definitely wasn't as big as the as the england one but it still was big because of the personalities that were involved and the way that they interacted with each other when you arrive on set and you sometimes you don't know who you're going to get given right so when you get the players that you know haven't got the best personalities (laughs) it is almost a bit like right we need to adapt as well on on set to try and get the most out of them yeah. when you get given those plays that you know are either going to make a mistake or say something out of turn or just be themselves and, and actually just want to enjoy the content that's what really makes the gold isn't it oh absolutely It, like I said that is a gift when yeah. you get plays like that the moment Jack and John walked in I was like oh my god this is amazing did you not know you were getting those two uh, no I did but I think like you will know so, so often happens things change <laughs> yeah. all the time and you never yeah, know yeah. really until they walk it, in yeah, exactly yeah. um and so uh, but straight away i got on with them and mm-hmm. part of the beauty was that of that was i forgot i was on camera yeah. i was having such a good time mm-hmm. just listening to them two yeah. that i was then almost asking the questions that other people wanted to yeah. know the answers to because i wanted to because it was just a natural thing because of how magnetic they both were and how much mm-hmm. you just drawn towards them as a duo so yeah it was um and it is that kind of thing where as from a presenter's point of view if you get good people if you get players you know we're talking about football here but if you get players with great personalities or who you know are going to give like you immediately relax and go right i know i can have a good time here i know we're just gonna this is gonna be like two mates chatting and having fun exactly yeah exactly where do you kind of see the future then of of sort of sports sponsorship i know we've touched on it a little bit around the the peak behind the curtain people being raw but what where do you kind of see the next two three five years going I think it's only going to get bigger. Obviously, that's it's going to have to go bigger. I don't know where exactly it's going to go, but I imagine we are going to see a lot more sports um, tapping into it and making sure that they're showing more of their personalities and you know behind going behind the scenes and seeing stuff. Um, because I think the other thing is that because football players now have their own social media channels, like. People are forced into doing that. We want more. We, as you know, particularly in this country, I feel like we want more. We want to see the good, the bad and the ugly. So show us. So I don't know exactly where it's going to go. But, you know, I could take a very educated guess that the direction is it's only going to get bigger and bigger and more accessible. Yeah, which is really exciting. Exciting for yeah, for you guys. Three, You're buzzing. You. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. I'm excited. Are you excited? I, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Emma, thank you very much for coming in to have a chat with us today. Um, just in case anyone doesn't know where you are on social, do you want to kind of plug, plug your social channels where people can thank find you? you. Uh, I'm at El Jones UK on Instagram and uh, Twitter, and I recently got TikTok too, and I bloody love it. I'm at El Jones UK on there as well. Brilliant. John, Amazing. where yeah, can we you find can you? You can catch me on LinkedIn, John Butler, CEO of Trunk BBI.
Do you know what? People load your Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Share with the group, John. <laughs> That's private. <laughs> well, you can I've, find... only, I've only got family photos on there. <laughs> you can find me on Instagram. It's uh, Insta by Adam. And you can find Trunk BBI on Instagram, Trunk BBI. And you can find me on LinkedIn, Adam Britton. And you can also head to our website, trunkbbi.com. Join us next time where we'll be joined by Steve Bland, podcast host from You, Me and the Big C, but also Sales Sharks PR consultant. See you soon. Thanks. Say goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>